Welcome to the Fraser Valley Flood Mitigation Program Information Session. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Arzina Hamir. I'm Manager of Programs here at IAF. Here's the agenda for today. We're going to start with some short introductions uh, to IAF, the, the Fraser Valley Flood Mitigation Stream 1 Mitigation Planning and Community Project. We'll then cover who can apply and what activities are eligible through the program. We'll review how to apply to the program, and then we'll just end with some Q&As. The Investment Agriculture Foundation of BC, also called IAF, delivers programs and services to support a thriving agriculture and agri-food sector in British Columbia. With 25 plus years of experience, IAF is recognized as the leading provider of high quality and cost-effective program delivery services to the agriculture and agri-food sector in BC. Since 1996, we've delivered more than $250 million to industry on behalf of the federal and provincial government. The F Fraser Valley Flood Mitigation Program is a multi-year, up to $20 million program funded by the government of BC through the Ministry of Agriculture and Food and delivered by the Investment Agriculture Foundation of BC. The program's goal is to increase BC's food security through improved flood resiliency and environmental conservation in the Fraser Valley. The program objectives are to reduce farmers and communities direct costs for infrastructure required for flood mitigation in the Fraser Valley. To restore riparian area ecosystems and water quality as a co-benefit of flood mitigation and to encourage collaboration between Indigenous groups, local communities, and agricultural producers. Flood, flooding is a common hazard in British Columbia farmland because of the heavy rainfall, snow melt, or ice jams. When a watercourse overflows its banks, Floodplains store the water until it can move downstream or until it can be absorbed into the ground. Working with indigenous and or local communities, the program will provide funding to agricultural producers and or organizations at high risk of flooding for solutions focused flood mitigation projects, including riparian and ecosystem habitat restoration. There will be two streams of funding. However, we won't be covering stream two in this webinar. Stream two is specifically for on-farm mitigation projects. To be eligible, you must be located in the same area as stream one, which we'll, we'll review in a moment. Individuals who want to apply for stream two or the on-farm uh, mitigation pro process uh, can apply through extreme weather preparedness and best management practices programs, where dollars are specifically set aside for Fraser Valley farms in the flood zone area at a higher cost ratio. The intake will open in July. Okay, let's talk about eligibility. For this stream one, organizations must be uh, located in BC. They must be a nonprofit organization, which includes food, agriculture industry associations, indigenous groups and organizations, and local government. They must also be in, the project must actually be in the electoral geographical areas of the Fraser Valley Regional District, which includes BC electoral areas B to H, Hope, Kent, Harrison Hot Springs, Chilliwack, Mission, and Abbotsford. And there is also a section of the Township of Langley that is eligible. They must be located within the blue zones of the flood map. Now, what flood map are we talking about? The map is provided on the IAF website, and I'm just going to click through. This is what it will look like. So this is a section of the flood map that I just referenced to. Areas located within the blue zone are considered eligible for this project. The full map is available on the program page and can be zoomed in on very close. So for example, if you click, you can zoom in and see more detail. 
Priority will be given to five areas at high risk of flooding in the Fraser Valley, which are the Sumas, Prairie, Sumas River Prairie in Abbotsford and Chilliwack, Hatsik Lake in the Mission and Fraser Valley Regional District, Claiborne Creek, Abbotsford, Nickaman Island in the Fraser Valley Regional District, and Glen Valley in the Township of Langley. Okay, so to apply for Stream 1, it is a two-step process. First, eligible participants will, will submit an expression of interest. The purpose of the expression of interest is to determine the eligibility of your organization for funding and the eligibility of your project concept. Following the EOI evaluation, eligible applicants will be invited by email notification to submit a full application. The purpose of the full application is to solicit all the information required for the funding decision. So just to reiterate, the EOI is not the full application, it's just a concept idea. The full application will then get into more details. So we're just going to talk about some tip, tips for success through the EOI pro process. First and foremost is partnerships. Community project part participants will need to have completed a planning initiative through this prog program or through a comparable process. Projects will require at least one letter of support from a food or agriculture industry association, First Nation, and or another local group. So there's three steps in the project um, process. Planning includes development of project proposals for the indicated area that address water management, flood decision, sorry, flood resilience, and or habitat conservation. In the project inception, this is a process is related to the creation and submission of documentation required for permits or bids. And then lastly, project implementation. Projects that include, but are not limited to, crop selection, diversification, conservation covenants, flood water mitigation, swales, berms, uh, wetland floodgate, culvert improvements, embankment stabilization, naturalization, removal of, um, or removal, redesign, replacement of infrastructure. Let's talk about scale. We know that flood mitigation requires engineering works, permits, concurrence across multiple jurisdiction. Subject matter specialists and engineers will be need to be brought in and actual on the ground works will need to be in place within two years. This will take a substantial amount of funds. The province has provided guidance that applications that have a large impact scale that are closer to the $5 million in budget will be preferred over small projects sprinkled throughout the region. Let's go over some of those technical solutions that can be included in the project. They include crop selection and or diversification, conservation covenants, flood water mitigation, swales, berms, wetlands, floodgate or culvert improvements, embankment stabilization and or naturalization, the removal, re redesign, or replacement of infrastructure, and more. I'm sure there are more ideas within the community. Now, there must um, be, a, a, uh, I guess, a seen benefit to agriculture in the Fraser Valley through this project. Projects will be evaluated on their impact on agriculture in the Fraser Valley, Valley and the ability of the project to improve the resiliency of the farming community in the Fraser Valley. The areas of projects that will be evaluated on this include, uh, looking at the types of farms in the project area, the area impacted by the project, so the number of hectares, 
and the dollar value of infrastructure impacted. Planning and execution. Applications must include both planning and execution components. This is going to be really important. Planning projects cannot be standalone activity and must be complemented together with inception and or implementation projects. So um, just looking at um, increasing, for example, um, understanding and outreach in the farming community alone is, would not be considered an impl implementation project. Stackability. Projects are stackable with other sources of funding, such as EMBC, but these should not exceed 100% of the project costs. So there are a number of important dates to look at. You're currently at the Fraser Valley webinar, so yay. August 1st will be the deadline to submit an expression of interest. Um, the submissions uh, that do go forward for a successful with a successful EOI, that will be decided on August 31st. There will then be a, a further deadline for submission of full application. Funding decisions will be made at the end of October when applicants will be notified. And then November 1st is when contribution agreements are signed. Great, we've made it through the, the bulk of the, the webinar and I hope there's enough time to answer all of the questions. Great. Um, Dylan, did you have any other, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't introduce you, Dylan. Do you wanna do a, a brief introduction and if you have any words to, to say? From the Ministry of Agriculture and Food, I'm Dylan Trillock. Uh, Director of Strategic Climate Initiatives. Um, we're, we're really happy to support the IAF in this project and uh, happy to, to take any other questions or connections around kind of collaboration and, and coordination on this um, offline if, uh, if folks would like to reach out to me. Um, really, really excited about this stream of funding launching. Um, really excited to see what kind of ideas come forward. Um, I'll, I'll definitely just emphasize, you know, that the point that Arzina, I think, has made throughout around partnership um, and that, that this is really kind of hearing the, the need and the opportunity for partnership around these issues. We know, like, this funding is not going to, you know, fill the, all the need that's out there, um, but it's exciting to see what kind of partnerships might be uh, catalyzed or supported to take the, the further step through this. Um, and looking forward to see what comes out uh, of the EOI process. Thanks. Yeah. Aaron, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. Um, if Aaron, you wouldn't mind reading out any questions that people have. Sure. So the first question is, is funding first come, first serve? Um, we are going to look at uh, the application, your applicant eligibility first, um, the impact of you know, your, your project on the Fraser Valley, those are going to be the bigger, um, we, we haven't been given any kind of indication that it's first come first serve. We're really looking at impact versus how quickly you put in an application. So there's no rush. Um, those two are the, the, the big, big indicators of moving forward. Um, the partnerships, who are all involved, and the actual project itself, the quality of the project. So, good question. The second question is, is the letter of support needed for the EOI stage or only after you're past the EI, uh, EOI stage and you've been invited to make a full application? Yeah, uh, we would like to see at least one letter of support at the EOI stage um, because, you know, we need to see some a level of commitment that partners have been properly um, notified and that they are on board um, and they are, there are true partnerships. So at least one at the EOI stage uh, is, would be my recommendation. All right, next question. Can a municipality jointly submit with a First Nations government? 
Absolutely. Um, in fact, we would love that type of partnership, but we will need to have a single lead applicant so that we know who to cut the check to and you know who the project lead is. So a partnership like that is great. Um, but as you know, when you're applying for funding, um, one name will have to be the lead. Um, you know, on the project actual, um, the workings on the ground, you can be co-leads, but in the application process, there does need to be a single organization. In the case of removal, redesign, and or replacement of infrastructure, what is covered, i.e. salaries, contractor fees, materials, equipment, et cetera? I would say all of the above. Um, you know, any of those costs that are associated with those activities um, are covered. I believe Dylan's on um, the call today. Can I just confirm with you, Dylan, is that your understanding as well? Yeah, that's my understanding as yeah. well. Okay, thanks. A good question. For local governments, will detailed um, or engineered designs need to be completed at the time of application submission, or could funding be received for both engineering design and implementation? My understanding is that the inception um, phase is the design side. And so those those costs can be covered. Um, and, you know, uh, understanding that at the end of the day, we do want to see actual implementation. So um, budgeting so that not all of your funds are taken up by the, the planning and inception phase, and you do have actual implementation, but all three um, phases of project um, rollout are covered. Okay. Um, someone is wondering if projects located solely in Pitt Meadows, which is um, in the blue area on the map, are eligible for funding. If it's in the blue area, um, it is eligible. Arzine, I do want to jump in quickly, actually, because yes. Meadows is not in the Fraser Valley Regional District or Thank in the you. section of Langley. So while there are areas that are flood risk in Pitt Meadows, it is in part of the other geographic requirement, which is being within the Fraser Valley Regional District. Thanks for that. And apologies, my um, geographical understanding of the Fraser Valley is still very weak. I'm more of an island person. So thanks for pointing that out. It, yes. So first, first area, Fraser Valley Regional District and the Township of Langley are the two areas. And then within those, it's the blue zones. So the map that's um, provided may sh have shown areas such as Delta or Richmond that were outside. Um, so just because you are in, if it looks like you're in the blue zone, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're eligible. So it is within Fraser Valley Regional District and the township of Langley. Those are the two kind of um, uh, limits of, of the geographical area. Okay. Does the project cost need to be a part of the EOI or is that something that can wait to the application stage? Um, we're gonna wanna see some rough idea of an estimate of what you think the project, like so that we understand what the scale of the project is. Um, as we mentioned before, that scale and impact is going to be really important on the way we, we rank um, projects. So not exact costing, but a rough estimate would be helpful. Are universities an eligible applicant type for the program? And can for-profit organizations um, apply as partners or co-apply as partners? So universities were not listed as, as one of the organizations that could be eligible to apply. Um, so it, it does need to be a nonprofit group, a First Nation, a municipality, or regional district. Um, the university could be a partner, um, if, absolutely, but uh, lead applicants should be within one of those um, groups. And apologies, Aaron, could you repeat the second part of the question? Um, it was kind of related. It says, yeah. can for-profit organizations co-apply as partners? Uh, not as the leads, um, but 
obviously, if you've got an engineering firm or an, uh, an organization that has expertise in this area, they can be a, you know, one of your partners. Okay. And uh, this is a related question. By project partners, do you mean non-financial support from stakeholder organizations impacted by the proposed projects, or do they need to be financial partnerships? It doesn't necessarily need to be financial. Um, you know, obviously, uh, if there is some financial, and especially if you have a very big project and, you know, funding um, is beyond the scope of, of this one, um, if there is some, some contribution from partners, that's, that's appreciated, but they do not need to be financial partners. Um, you know, this fund does provide 100% costing coverage of, of costs for all the eligible costs within programs. So that is not a necessary requirement for partnership. It doesn't need to be um, financial, but of course, if it's there, that's an extra. Okay. It was mentioned that the funds are multi-year and what does that mean for projects? Can we apply for a two-year grant or more? Yes, in fact, that's it's probably going to be recommended that this is, you will apply for a single amount covering multiple years, um, if that's how long it takes to do the three processes, the planning, inception, and the actual on the ground works. So we're, as we're assuming, um, especially because of the start date can't be before November 1st, that this is going to be covering a multiple number of years. Um, when IF provides um, a contract, it will state those dates um, and the funding will be released on um, a phased approach. So we do have, um, you know, uh, uh, not all of the funding is provided up front. Um, there are different stages of when funding is released um, at INSEP, like when the contract is signed, um, there is an amount and then at the one year, and then there is a holdback um, so that the final reporting is done before the final um, dollars are released. So that can span um, across multiple years. Um, the final um, payment does happen, and the final reporting does have to happen at the end of 2025. So those are the parameters for when um, the timing of, of the projects. Uh, reporting back to the province has to happen in early 2026. So projects need to be um, finished and um, all project costs need to be done by December 2025. Will detailed cost estimates need to be submitted at the time of application? And if the project is over its estimated cost, will additional funds be made available Mm -hmm. or will the contribution be capped based on the estimate that was included in the submission? Yeah, I mean, I know that's a tough one. So first of all, you don't need detailed um, uh, estimates at the EOI stage, but at the project um, full application, we will need those detailed um, estimates. And understanding that this is a multi-year um, grant, uh, we know that this can happen, but um, those types of adjustments would have to be done on a case by case basis. So I wouldn't be able to say at the moment if we have the funds available, um, you know, that may be a conversation with each of with with the project. But um, generally, um, we don't we try not to have that um, happen. Uh, yeah, but we understand, you know, if there is. Um, a change in, in costing. So um, we'll have to have that conversation with each of the projects. Is the $20 million um, budget, is that specifically for stream one or for the program as a whole? Um, approximately three quarters is for stream one. Um, we have you know, a, a smaller amount that will be rolled out for stream two. Um, so that's the approximate breakdown. If a municipality intends to undertake the work with their own forces, is that project eligible for funding? For example, culvert installation, new ditch or swale construction, et cetera? I believe that that project does sound um, that it's possible, but understanding it would, you would need to have more than one partner. So the municipality on its own um, would, would probably not be a very strong application. 
Um, also remembering that, yes, the culvert, culvert um, you know, removal and, and um, you know, phasing up is, is an eligible project. It's really the impacts to agriculture. So having those farms, for example, that will be impacted be a partner in this project will that will be important from the beginning too so uh, i don't recommend having just a single applicant on their own um, making sure that uh, agriculture community that first nations are also um, being consulted and, and are on side in terms of prioritization are engagement projects prioritized lower than infrastructure projects um, engagement on its own would not be a, um, an eligible project. Uh, so, you know, if I go back to that um, slide, we do need to see both um, planning or engagement and execution. So those two combined are necessary. Does the organization applying need to be located in the blue zone or can the project work be located in the blue zone of the map with the applicant organization's actual address um, somewhere outside of the blue zone? Yeah, I believe that's that's um, eligible as long as the organization is located within British Columbia. Um, we don't fund organizations outside of the province. So yes, your organization doesn't have to necessarily be in the blue zone. This question says, is the 200,000 to 5 million per First Nation community, will it be distributed over time or a one-time distribution? So it's it's per project. So if, if there are multiple First Nations that are partnering within that same project, it would then be dispersed amongst. Um, so if I hope that answers that question. And then, um, I think I answered previously that uh, the dollars will be distributed in a phased approach at signing of contract at the one year and then um, by the time of final final project um, reporting that there is a holdback at the, the very end. And once that reporting is in place and accepted, then the last amounts are, are released. Can a municipality partner with a local farmer that experiences flooding issues? And would a partner letter of support be accepted from a local farmer? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, that could certainly be a partnership. Um, if it's a single farmer um, versus um, an area, you know, if we had two projects that were very similar and one had a single farmer versus um, a larger, I guess, area, again, remember its impact to agriculture is the important outcome that we want to see. So if the impact is kind of limited to one farm, albeit if it's a very large farm, um, that might be the exception, but I would say you probably want to cast your net a little bit wider than a single farm. Can an organization be involved as a partner in more than one application? Oh, that's a good question. I hadn't seen anything um, that said not. Um, if you have the capacity to be working with two um, two leads or two uh, projects going on at the same time, um, you know, I I think we understand that this is not um, there are not a number of a large number of players in flood mitigation in the Fraser Valley, and it might require um, an organization to have input in more than one. So um, Dylan, did you, any comments on that? Yeah, no, completely agree with what yeah. you said, Arzina. Um, you know, just I, I even take the example of like within two of the hotspots of Sumas Prairie and Nicomen Island, you've got uh, First Nation, Kamal First Nation that has uh, traditional territory interests on the other side of the Fraser. And I think you're going to see a lot of community groups have interests um, in different parts of the valley. So yeah, absolutely, I think. But but I do think it probably makes sense that project leads are, um, are, are distinct, don't have a strong feeling on that. But um, I, I think generally we're thinking those are different project leads. 
absolutely though i expect some of the same groups will show up on different projects yeah and apologies dylan were there any other questions that you wanted to add um subsequent information about or um that i missed or maybe you don't agree with <laughs> <laughs> no i think I, I think you're you're answering um all the all the questions okay. um i think what one piece of clarification because i saw there were a few questions about first come first serve and kind of different information out there on this i think that's a stream one versus stream two differentiation there and i think you gave a great answer on stream one um and then that stream that stream two piece that's of course a, a future uh, a future conversation but um I, I, you can confirm my understanding is that stream two on that individual on farm but that is more of a first come first serve model yeah. whereas i think the description you gave about how this stream of funding for community scale projects works is uh, is kind of as you've outlined can improvement districts such as daid apply and for context daid is the Dudney Area Improvement District, whose purpose is to maintain the section of dike from Dudney Trunk Road and Low Heed Highway in Mission BC to Bell Road in Dudney BC. So it's it's um, a government authority specifically caretaking this dike. I would say yes. You know, if you're our legal entity, um, you're a nonprofit, um, that would be you could be an applicant. Um, again, partnership with um with either the farms around you or the first nations around you um would make for a stronger application but i don't see i don't have any anything saying why you couldn't be one of the leads one question is just discussing um the difference between stream one and stream two mm -hmm. yeah so i think as dylan just mentioned stream one is community level planning, inception, and implementation projects. So they are projects that are meant to be large in scope, um, impacting agriculture, um, support, you know, improving um, agriculture in the Fraser Valley um, with multiple partnership groups. Stream two would be akin to if, if people are more familiar with the EFP process, EFP BMP process, where individual farms can apply to do flood mitigation projects on their own land. So whereas in stream one, individual farms cannot be the lead applicant, they can in stream two, and the project is can be bound just within the, um, you know, the parameters of, of their single farms. So that's the main difference. And as Dylan mentioned, within stream two, when that does release that will be more on a first come first basis until you know funds are depleted. Whereas um, stream one, we are taking a much more careful look and a, sl a slower look, um, looking at impact and um, you know the, the qualities of the project uh, rather than how quickly the project came in. Another question is, does the applicant need to be the ultimate owner of the works or can they be handed over to another entity? Oh, I don't believe that need, they need to be the, the owner of works. Um, you know, if, if they have, if the lead applicant has the capacity to do project um, management, um, but they don't necessarily have physical benefit or they're not physically there, that's, that's fine. Um, yeah. And so, you know, if it's an, uh, I'm thinking maybe an agricultural organization um, that has members within the, the blue zone area within Fraser Valley Regional District or, or Glen Valley, but the organization itself, you know, will not be owning any kind of, of end project results, that's, that's fine. Yeah, and, and just to add on to what Arzine is saying as well, you know, a project could have multiple owners who are impacted by a project, and that, that's very much kind of that spirit of collaboration. You could have multiple public and private owners. Um, you could have land that is um, owned by a local government, by a First Nation, um, by a, a local farmer. So you could you could do a project that touches on all, all, all different types of ten years, as long as the project kind of clearly ties it all together. Any more questions? Nope, those are all the active questions. Okay, great. 
Well, again, I just want to thank everybody for taking time out of their, their noon hour to come and listen to this webinar. Um, please feel free to reach out and email me. I'll mention the email again. It's fvf at iefbc.ca. Um, you, or you can go to the website that's on the screen um, listed and, and the contact is also there. You can reach us through there. Um, really appreciate all of the, the great questions. I'm going to echo Dylan's comments and looking, really looking forward to seeing the, the EOIs the, that come in and seeing what type of collaborations happen in the Fraser Valley. Um, yeah, and so please reach out. Looking forward to, to connecting with, with you. Thanks again, everybody. And yeah, have a great rest of your day.